What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is uh, an interesting video setup we have going on here. I hope y'all miss me because uh, I've been gone for for too too long, and uh, I, I miss Noah. You know, we jumped back on the video, and it felt like it was a full season that we went without recording a video. Now we add Mike to the mix. This is possibly the first three way we've ever done on our channel. Unless you're a Patreon member, you've seen a few of the three ways gone, uh, exclusive content member wise. But we're doing something a little different, and I know we weren't doing any intros. 2020 is the year of zero intros, but we had to intro this one because this is a new show that we are introducing to the channel. This is completely Dynasty related. Dynasty Fantasy Football every Wednesday. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns featuring Noah at FB God, featuring my man Mike at Mike Me on Twitter. Don't fucking interrupt me. This is not how this works. You don't interrupt my intro because when I'm doing the intros, they're smooth. Until then, don't interrupt me. All right, so this is going to be Dynasty every Wednesday, Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Today's video is a first-round rookie mock draft, 12 teams. We're going to start off with one quarterback leagues. Uh, at the end, we might discuss a few quarterbacks, but we have a long offseason, so we will get, we'll be getting into all different types of mock drafts. We'll be getting all different types of player breakdowns, and um, this is going to be primarily Noah and Mike's show. They're going to take this over. I will appear sporadically as I feel like it. Uh, Mike is over on the West Coast. So he gets out of work kind of late, and that's like past my bedtime. So a lot of the time, I'm just not going to want to fucking jump on with them. But they they will take good care of y'all. Noah's been jumping in. Uh, I see on Twitter, he's been getting into his dynasty stuff. Mike plays in Debbie League, so he really knows what the fuck he's talking about. So if you're not already following them too, make sure you do that on Twitter. How we doing, boys? Are we ready? That was a long-winded intro. The last one of the year, I promise. Glad to be here. Glad to be here, man. Glad to have you. You guys look very pretty today. And uh, this is Mike's first video ever. He's been doing... Uh, some blogging, recently getting into the podcast game, but this is his first time on video. So make sure that you uh, drop a comment and let him know how how pretty he looks. Y'all ready mm -hmm. to go? Born Let's right. do it. Hit the intro, baby. All right. As we, uh, as we hit the offseason, I know it's early, and obviously rookie draft probably won't be hitting the radar until after the NFL draft. Um, so I think it's still good to get a grasp on who the rookies are. And admittedly, I'm not someone who's dove into all of the rookies so far. I'm starting to catch my footing a little bit and, you know, realizing the names and the schools and the stats and shit that's important right now. One thing that you realize very quickly when you dive into the rookies this year is that there is an – I'm not going to say inarguable 101, but if DeAndre Swift is not the 101 in your rookie draft, the people you're drafting with are fucking idiots. So DeAndre Swift, running back out of the University of Georgia, this kid does absolutely everything you can ask for. He checks basically every box that you can have for a running back prospect. And we obviously can't project um, or we can't go off of his, his athleticism. The combine is still yet to come. We have to know where he's drafted. We have to know what team he lands on the opportunity. But this kid's going to be a first-round pick more likely than not, and he will be the feature back wherever he lands. He's got the good size, 5'9", 5'10", between 215-ish, 220 at his heaviest. Um, he'll be 21 when he enters the season, so he's ripe. He's right into that uh, fresh zone of, you know, where the prime is for a running back that comes in and dominates kind of early. At Georgia last year, wrapped up. Over 1,400 yards from scrimmage. Uh, I mean, he's just been doing this for a couple of years now. He's someone who's caught multiple uh, seasons of 24 passes or more. He's coming off a 24-catch season this year, 32 the year before that. So he's got the size. He's likely going to have the speed when they test him at the combine. He's got the production, 6.2 yards per carry this year, 6.4 yards the year before that, 7.6 yards per carry in his freshman year, which he didn't do much because he was sitting behind Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle. But those yards per carry against the SEC is so important. Like you want to make sure that you drill that into your head when you're pro uh, prospecting out these rookie running backs. You want to see what kind of competition they have. And when you're doing that in the SEC, it's super, super, super important. So you have tough competition, production, stats, size, speed, receptions. I mean, he does everything um, that you could possibly ask for in a rookie running back. So he's going to get into the NFL and immediately have uh, the featured role somewhere. So – um, with that being said, are there any arguments there at the one-on-one? None at all. I mm -hmm. think another good point to bring up about Swift is he didn't have that huge workload like a guy we're going to bring up later had. Even this year when he was like the clear-cut lead back, he was used fairly like sparingly throughout the season. I'm not sure if it was because of injury or anything, but him having fresh legs going to the season, I know that was a knock on Josh Jacobs last year, but I think we saw that that shouldn't necessarily be a, like a knock against a prospect. 
especially if they're drafted in the first or second round and taken to be that true bell cow, which I think Swift at his size can do. Honestly, just I watching him play. Two twenty. I mean, 220 touches is good enough for me to be like, okay, he can handle a load at the college level. He did leave the Georgia Tech game. I think it was like week 12 with a shoulder injury, and then he barely got any touches uh, over the next couple games. So the workload would have been probably like 40 touches bigger uh, had he not gotten injured towards the end of the year. So that's just something to kind of throw in there. Yeah, and I just want to like bring up one comp after we like finish talking about a player, just who I think that they remind me of. For me, it's Dalvin Cook. Just because they can do it in all facets of the game, he's extremely elusive. He's quick. He's fast just from what you see on tape. And I think at the next le- level, the fact that he did it in the SEC for three straight years, like facing decent enough competition on his own team uh, is more than enough for me to have confidence in him being a very valuable fantasy asset going forward. Yeah, I, I think Cook was my original comparison with him. That's why I had like, the Spider-Man meme with Cook and uh... – or that I switch it to Zeke afterwards, but I, I feel like Cook is, um, they're both ridiculously elusive and can break tackles, but I almost feel like Cook is more flashy, you know, like the elusiveness that Cook shows is more like on film. You're like, holy shit, like um, almost like a little bit of a shady-esque to him, but I, I feel like uh, Swift is able to break tackles in, in like every asset, you know, he uses his power, his agility, his, his contact balance, his uh, awareness, all those kind of things are kind of baked into him, which is why I feel like he's more or less flashy, which favors more Zeke in my comparison than it does Dalvin Cook. But I think either are, are probably right on the head. Yeah. So it's been like my one oh one since like last year, he could have not played another down this year and he still would have been a one oh one. He's like the most pro ready three down threat that you can get. You know, he's good in pass pro. He's good in receiving. He's good in running. He's got the most dank, dead leg you'll ever see (laughs) when you guys watch him he's literally snatching souls from linebackers and all of his highlights and it's one of the most beautiful things you want to see um i saw another great comp for him um the other day on twitter and uh, it was matt forte which was actually a really good comp they they share a lot of the same skill sets and in terms of like pro ready and translating to the nfl i think he's the best yeah i think we can all kind of agree on that so 102 take it away i don't know if we even fucking decided who's doing 102 but somebody jump in we give it to mike because i was about to take his favorite player <laughs> yeah uh so i'm gonna throw a little bit of curveball here and i'm gonna go with my man cam Akers uh out of florida state uh university and i know the most people consensus are gonna be going with jonathan taylor uh because of the production but i mean when i look at the film and when i look at what Akers was able to do at fsu in his three years it's actually incredible given how bad his O-line was. Uh, yeah, I think, I think first of all, that's like the thing that if, if you have never heard of Cam Akers, he is this like incredibly like elusive, gifted running back at Florida State. But Florida State's offensive line has been it, shit on over the last couple of years, it's just how bad they were. So anything that Cam Akers has produced has come completely on his own. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure Mike has the numbers for it, but just I have it right here. Their offensive line ranked 115 out of 130 per football outsiders adjusted yeah. line yards. In this season, the team's rushing yards, 97.4% came after contact. So they were getting absolutely nothing in terms of blocking. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great point. And honestly, 114 might be an overestimate of how good that O-line is. Um, I saw a crazy stat on Twitter the other day. Um, Florida State's offensive line on first and second running down situations gained two total yards in the entire year. That's two yards. Not two yards per carry. That's two yards total. I can't that's one of the – that's one of the worst contact, but still it's fucking ridiculous. That's one of the worst in like college football history. Uh, so basically when the, when the people knew that they were going to run it, it was all cam Akers. And even despite all that, he was still able to average five yards per carry, put up over 1100 yards on the ground. He's also very involved in the receiving game and he put up like 14 tutties. So this man is literally getting it done. And if you watch the film, I think the things that jump out to me most are one is footwork. And the footwork is good because he's always getting met at behind the line of scrimmage. So he's turning negative yards into like three or four yards, uh, which are positive yards, which is a really big deal, I think, for the NFL. Um, I'm not really that bought into guys that like bust 80 yard runs all the time, even though he can do that. He has long speed. He has the burst. I'm more interested in how they like work in tight spaces and convert um, negative situations to positive, positive ones. And that's something that Cam does really well. Uh, this guy's going to be an absolute phenom at the combine. I don't think people realize how athletic he is, um, but he ran a four four in high school, he had like a forty inch uh, vertical jump. Like this guy's going to jump out the gym in the combine. I think he's going to get a lot of traction. And once people really see how athletic he is and what he was able to accomplish at Florida State, I kind of yeah. fucking hate when people bring up those numbers though, like the high school athleticism numbers. Like that shit is so unofficial. 
Uh, this is a I mean, it depends where you're getting measured, but yeah. That's what, yeah. I mean, I, you can project on athleticism, but I, for people that get all of, you know, fucking upset about it, like myself, and for people who start tweeting about it, like, oh, he's so athletic, he ran this in high school. It's like, okay, wait for the combine to actually measure it um, for real. And the other thing to say is like, everybody always likes to jump in and being like, oh, the combine is not really that serious. But what it does in, in respect is, is it tells you how fast the guy is relative to other NFL type players, right? Like the, the difference between me drafting a guy because of a, a half of a tenth of a second is not like, that's not what I'm excited about. It's just like, it tells you that this guy's very fast compared to NFL defenders. Because when you watch film, one guy could look really fast but you don't know who the defenders are that he's going against. Are those linebackers guys that are not agile, that can't move their hips and shit? Are there, are those guys running four sevens at the combine compared to four or five linebackers in the NFL? Like that's why I wait for the NFL combine to uh, kind of touch on athleticism because you have no idea on tape what those defenders were athletically. For sure. For sure. And I think he's someone that I'm using the combine to basically affirm what I see on film because right. When you watch him on film, when he when he hits the edge, like nobody catches him. He's got insane burst and just really good long speed. Uh, so it's like it's how I use combine normally. I never really rely on it to as a positive enforcer in the sense that if I see someone run like a four three or four four, if I didn't like them before, I'm not going to care after the combine. What I yeah. do combine for though is if I like someone before and they go to the combine, they run like a four six and four seven, I'm like, okay, that guy's kind of off my list because athletically he just doesn't test well. And you know there's still outliers, guys like Singletary go in and do stuff, but I'm I'm fine fading those types of outliers. To yeah, there's like two spec there's two sides of the spectrum when it comes to the combine. It's like someone who runs really fucking fast and someone who runs really slow. When you hit that fast peak, that does that far from guaranteed success. But when you hit the really, really slow side of the spectrum, that almost almost always tells you that you're not an NFL caliber player. That's the way you have to look at these combine numbers. Yeah, we saw that last year out of Elijah Holyfield. I mean, on tape, the guy looked phenomenal, right? He was, like, big. He was fast. He was yeah. not fast, but he looked strong. But then you see this dude run. He's got, like, two pianos on his back, <laughs> and he's not even drafted. So I don't – that's, like, one thing about Akers. You can just tell by watching him he's not going to run a 4 eight. He's not going to run a 4-6. He'll mm -hmm. probably be in that 4-4 four, four to 4-5 four, range, as you said. And the reason why I agree with you, and he's my RB2 as well, is because you look at the situation he was in, and my comp to him, not necessarily skill-wise, but situation-wise, is Joe Mixon, where we saw this year, despite having nothing to work with, the guy produced. And I think for Cam Akers, that's like a huge like part of his potential is because we don't know where he's going to land right now. But wherever it is, it's most likely going to be better than Florida State. So he's more one of the more like landing spot independent players in this class. So at this point, not knowing where he lands, I feel extremely confident picking him, you know, top two, top three. All right. So who do you feel confident at the 103? I mean, I feel confident in Jonathan Taylor, but me feeling confident in his knees is going to be a completely different story because this guy has like 970 touches uh, logged through three seasons, which is he an absolute injuries. No, he hasn't. But I will say that that could be, I'm not sure if anybody's doing any studies on how that correlates to injuries, but when we saw Derrick Henry like rack up 600 touches these past two seasons in college, that guy was getting a ton his last year at Alabama. But um, I think just what we've seen from Jonathan Taylor during his three years at Wisconsin, right? He's the second leading rusher there in only three seasons. Uh, he has like two or three, all the seasons went over 2000 yards from scrimmage. Even this year, right? He was not known as a pass catcher, but he racked up, I think 26 receptions, five of them went for touchdowns. And we see guys like Leonard Fournette and Ezekiel Elliott who aren't necessarily the best pass catchers. They aren't weapons in the passing game, but they get used because teams know that they're valuable. Even if it's just a dump off, even if it's just a screen, so I think at the next level, just with the athleticism we've seen out of Taylor, like the guy runs for the four by 100 relay for a D1 track team at like 225 pounds. That just shows that at his size, I mean, no matter the size, you have to be athletic to do that. Him being that big and having like a full season of workload and still being able to compete in another sport just shows his athleticism. Uh, whoever drafts him, it's going to be in the first or second round. They're going to want to use him in all facets of the game. That's not to say he's like a complete back who's going to catch 70, 80 balls. But I think him catching 35, 40, 45 passes as a rookie isn't out of the question. And for fantasy purposes, for a guy who can get that solid floor with those receptions, you know, racking up tons of yards with breakaway runs, but also just taking the yards that are given to him. He could be a guy who sees 18 to 20 touches and takes it for 85 yards and a touchdown. And you're going to be more than happy with that week after week. So um, I think his skill set translates directly to the NFL. And that's why I'm pretty high on him. Red flags for Taylor you know, thinking about him now or coming into the season, it was that the workload was ridiculous and we hadn't seen the reception side of things yet. Um, that was the big concern for me is, is he going to be a first and second down guy and not be able to catch balls? 
because in the first two seasons, he caught eight, eight catches in each season. This year, he hit that 26 catch threshold. And I'm like, all right, I'm good to go. I don't really need to know much more about him as a pass catcher because they use him to do so. But I, I like, I don't think we can hammer home enough. Like how much, again, I'm, I'm trying to think of people that weren't watching college football at all this year or haven't been watching much. Right. And they're just getting into the rookie drafts. Like Jonathan Taylor produced at one of the most prolific levels of any college football player of all time. I mean, you said 2000 yards from scrimmage, three straight season, top 10 in the Heisman voting all three seasons that he was at Wisconsin did it against good uh good defenses obviously he's in the big 10 um so this year was just a big year in terms of showing us that he can actually catch the ball um he went off he went nuts he had like th three or four straight games of over 200 rushing yards this year again it depends on what side of the scale you're on with the workload and some of it being too much but I think at the end of the day when you're drafting rookies um like in in rookie drafts are you concerned like when you draft a rookie, you're like really trying to get that premium production from him like the first three to four years, right? Three, four, five years. Like maybe he breaks down when he's like 28. But at that point, like how much does that factor into you picking a rookie running back that has a lot of tread on his tires? Yeah, I think uh, I've come full circle on this. I used to think that the, the workload was a huge knock on Taylor. But based on a lot of the stuff that I've seen from guys I, I really trust on Twitter, um, I don't think the production is necessarily a knock on him, right? Even though he's a lot of touches, he's proven to be very durable. Like, he has not missed many games. He has not been injured. And if anything, his production shows that um, the people believe in his talent, right? Because want, they wanted to give him the opportunity. They want to give him the touches to produce for his offense. So I've kind of moved off that. Um, like you said, the other red flag was that he didn't really catch, catch anything, um, similar to every single other Wisconsin running back that went there. Um, but he did improve in that facet. And like Noah said, he's not a weapon, but he's capable and in terms of being just a pure runner, I think he's probably the best in his class. So from that perspective, you know, people compare him to Chubb, and I think that's a pretty accurate one, where we know that Chubb can house it from anywhere on the field, and he's a capable pass catcher, but in terms of running it, there's very few that do better than he does. Yeah, and there's just one other red flag I want to bring up, and it's fumbles. He had 18 over his three seasons, which is obviously six a season. He lost 15 of them, which is five a season, but you think about it right it's not like NFL teams don't know this when they draft him they knew that was an issue that's obviously something they're going to work on and it's not like he has like too much else to work on going into the NFL he's pro ready when it comes to running the ball maybe pass catching a little bit and even if he does fumble here and there to begin his career I don't think it's going to be like a death sentence to him like it was maybe with Chris Carson like even that guy fumbled like six times over two weeks and he still fumbled. played he's going to be a top two round pick and at that point you have a pretty good leash on the starting role so Jonathan Taylor is like literally a He's probably the most iconic name to come out in this draft from the running back position because we he just he's just produced at such a high level for such a long time that like an NFL team they'll see him blow away the combine and I don't even think we touched on his size but he's huge he's like five eleven six foot two hundred twenty like the the prototypical running back that NFL teams have been looking for for so long like this is who Jonathan Taylor is so we start off this draft with three straight running backs that could all absolutely be workhorses in the NFL and I don't think it stops there because at the one hundred four I'm gonna grab J.K. Dobbins from Ohio State. Now, he's another guy who surpassed 2,000 yards. So he went over 2,000 rushing yards this year on 300 carries, 6.7 yards per carry. Now, when I first dove in, um, you know, he's a hell of a running back. You watch his film, and he can also, you know, win on, in any aspect. He can catch the ball all three seasons at Ohio State. He caught over 20 passes. Um, he can make guys miss through his power, through his elusiveness. He's also about 5'10", five, 5'11", five, 215 to 220 pounds. So he's got the size. Um, he should have decent enough speed. Now, I know, uh, Mike, your boy, Ray Ray Q, I think. I, I forget what his name is. Ray GQ. Big Debbie guy, yeah. And I listened to a podcast he was on the other day, and he was talking about how J.K. Dobbins um, was one of the most athletic high school players to come out in that entire class. He had the highest spark score. So you kind of look at Dobbins, and he might look a little bit thicker. I know his comp was Josh Jacobs for him, so he's not a guy you look at and you're like, oh, my God, he's ripped. He's going to be so athletic. But he was really good in high school, going back to the high school thing. So I don't think he'll test at the combine as poorly as maybe some people might expect him to. But the production is there. He did it at a high level. The only concern was, like, looking at his numbers, you go back to 2018. It's like, what happened? Because freshman year, he broke out, right? True freshman, 1,400 yards uh, on the ground, another 200 and or another 135 through the air, right? And 7.2 yards per carry, which is a crazy number for a freshman. The next year, it dips down 4.6 yards per carry. So you're coming into this year and you're like, what kind of J.K. Dobbins am I going to get? And he pretty much erased any question that you might have from him as a running back prospect. Again, 2,250 yards from scrimmage, 23 total touchdowns this year. Uh, led the Ohio State offense for the most part, was one of the most prolific players in college at this point. So I think if he can get really good draft capital, which he should probably go in the top two rounds, 
Um, he should be a starter pretty much from from day one that contribute on all three downs. So it's it's almost like a, a toss up between almost all of these players. Like Swift would be my clear one on one, but I think like you can argue any of those three running backs from O two to O four, right? Yeah, I know a lot of people have uh, J.K. Dobbins as their one point oh one actually. Um, right. and getting a lot of steam. Like you said, he was an actual phenomenal athlete. So I expect him to test really well. I expect him, JT, and Cam Akers to basically light this combine up. It's going to be insane. Um, the one thing I noticed about JK is, like you said, he had a down year in his sophomore year. So I tried to dig into like why that was. And I think it's because they did not run much. Um, they didn't have a running quarterback. So in his first year, they had JT Barrett. And then in this year, when I watched all his film, like every single snap was an RPO. And obviously, we know Justin Fields is an absolute baller uh, when it comes to running it. So every single play, he was basically taking one of the defenders away. And that's a huge help to running backs. So I think that's something to monitor going into the draft. If he lands in like another place where they do run a ton of RPO with the running quarterbacks, it's going to be really beneficial for him. And if he doesn't, I'm slightly concerned, but not concerned enough to actually fade him. Yeah, I know we talked about that, Mike, too, and I was looking more into, like, other efficiency numbers, and 53.6% of his yards came after contact this year, which obviously shows he wasn't just, like, you know, one-on-one all the time, just beating some guy to the outside. He also broke 73 tackles this season, which is more than his first two years combined, so he definitely improved as a runner, just, you know, metrics-wise and breaking tackles-wise. He's obviously super athletic, but as you said, right, that one down year with Dwayne Haskins, that's what kind of makes me, like, a little bit more nervous about him than the other three guys, because... He seems to be a little bit more landing spot dependent than the top three who did it basically every season in every situation, whether it was good or whether it was bad, like it was with Cam Akers. So um, him landing in the first two rounds, obviously he's going to get that long leash being the workhorse back for whatever team he lands on. But I don't think he's necessarily as, um, you know, prone to not succeeding or whatever, because, you know, he's, he showed that down year when he didn't have everything working in his favor. Yeah, I mean, regardless, like you're looking at any of these guys at the 104 and they would be the clear RB1 last year, you know, so you're happy if you have a top pick um, and you land any of those guys, even with, you know, some made up question marks. So you could we're going to we're going to have to play devil's advocate here, obviously, as we go down the rookies and stuff. But like for the most part, um, these are guys that you're going to be really excited. So if you have multiple picks within the top four, like you're going to land two really, really, really solid RBs. Who do you think who do you guys think is? I guess, Mike, you would probably say Dobbins, right? Like, who do you think is the most likely to bust out of these four candidates? Most likely to bust would probably be my guy, Cam Akers. And the reason why I say that is because of draft capital. Like, Dobbins, Taylor, and Swift are getting all the hype in the mainstream NFL media as well. And that's something I'm paying attention to this year. Like, before, I didn't care because I'm like, oh, those guys are stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. But it really matters in terms of getting opportunity and how they they hype up uh, what teams they land on. And Akers is one, the one that's not getting much buzz. So that's the one I'm kind of worried about. And if he lands in a bad spot, he's still really raw. Like, this guy was a quarterback in high school. He was a converted quarterback. And despite being a converted quarterback, he came into college ranked as a number two running back. So that kind of tells you the athletic uh, ability of Cam Akers. This guy, like, I think he rushed for, like, 2,500 yards and, like, three, and passed for 3,000 yards in high school and had, like, 50 tutties or something like that. Something ridiculous. Just, like, video game numbers. Um, but he really does need to be developed. Um, so I want him to land in a good spot and if he doesn't land in a good spot I could easily see him like just getting phased out of the game yeah it's, I was surprised he took Akers at 102 I probably I I think I probably would have leaned Dobbins and then Taylor and then Akers would have been my 104 um, but again like this is this is going to be an interesting conversation to have all off season. so we'll move towards the 105 with Mike yeah, this is, this is actually a tough one. Uh, you know, you could easily go wide receiver here, but just given how deep this class is, I'm going to stick to running back uh, and take the last guy in that tier two of my rankings, and that's Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Um, this guy exploded onto the scene this year, along with the LSU offense and Joe Burrow, um, arguably probably the greatest college offense that I've ever seen in my lifetime, maybe only rivaled by the 2001 Miami Hurricanes in terms of talent and production, uh, the U, baby. And I think that the reason why I picked him is because, like everyone else, he has the ability and the assets to become a three-down back. Um, in terms of elusiveness, I think he's actually the most elusive back in this class. Um, there's a there's a hashtag going around called the Clyde, Clyde Shuffle, and if you watch him on film, uh, this guy's literally putting linebackers on skates like pretty much every time. 
And he comes in a little bit shorter, but he's by no means undersized. Like his BMI is still good. He's weighing in at like 210. Um, so he's definitely got the prototypical size. And he catches out of the backfield, but he also lines up as a receiver. And I think that's key, right? When I try and find receiving backs, I want to find guys that are a weapon in the receiving game, not just taking dump off passes. Because when you get to the NFL, um, there's going to be good receivers on your team. So you actually got to become an efficient receiver in order to get those targets. And Clyde Edwards O'Leary had 55 receptions this year. That's an unbelievable number for a college running back. Yeah, that's more than most college running backs finish with in their three to four year careers. So you my know, concern, my concern with Clyde though is I, he obviously catching fifty five balls means you're a very well and capable pass catcher. I, I wouldn't say he's like uh, like pass catching is not his, you know, his claim to fame here. Like he is a very capable guy, and he was put in a position, like you said, one of the best offenses of all time to catch a little. They threw the ball so fucking much that he caught a lot of balls. My concern is that. The, where he lands, obviously we don't know this now, but where he lands is going to dictate a huge portion of his value in rookie drafts. Because if he lands somewhere that doesn't fucking use him or utilize him correctly, like if he lands under an Adam Gase or something, his, his fucking value is going to plummet real yeah. quick, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. He's going to have to land in a place where they exploit their, his receiving ability. But don't get me wrong, like that's not all he's good at. He's also a fantastic runner. Like he can juke you out. He can lay the boom on the defender. Um, he's great after the contact. Like I rarely ever saw him falling backwards when I was watching the film. Um, and he's great in between the tackles. And he has an extremely low center of gravity. So he understands how to take on contact and win, win at the contact point. I think that's like one of his best traits. And like you said, it's going to be very landing spot dependent. But if he lands in like a good offense, the way I see him progressing is he'll land somewhere that uses his, his receiving ability and he'll eventually work his way into a lead role in a committee and be efficient with touches and become a valuable fantasy asset that way. I don't think he's someone that lands just day one and just explodes on the scene and takes over. It'll be more similar to like that Miles Sanders progression where you land in a spot in a committee and you kind of prove yourself and you learn throughout the time. And then once you become the lead dog, that's when you kind of put on a lot of production. Okay. Yeah, and just yeah. putting numbers to those, like what you were saying about him breaking tackles, right? He broke a tackle every three carries and he had the seventh most broken tackles in the entire NCAA this year after the catch. So whether it was him catching the ball or him getting handoffs, he was making men miss. And I think, you know, obviously the common knock, if there was going to be one is, oh, obviously he did well. He's in the best college offense of all time. But the fact that he could get more than half of his yards after contact and put up those type of crazy, like, elusiveness numbers just shows that even if he's not in the best situation, he can create for himself, which I really look for. Because when you look at these college running backs, and especially at the top four or five, they're all obviously really good in college because they're not going up against NFL talent every week, even though he's in the SEC. But the fact that he can do it on his own, he showed that even with playing, like, with Joe Burrow and all the other weapons they had on the outside, um, makes me feel a little bit more confident in Clyde edwards helaire at the next level. So, um, speaking on his versatility, right, rushing, receiving, I think something that can't go overstated is that he was their kick returner 2017, 2018, also had a bunch of kick returns this year too. So, uh, one thing that you want to really dive into when you're looking at rookies, right, if they're lacking somewhere in their production scheme, you know, he obviously doesn't lack anywhere. He was amongst like top three in basically every rushing category in the SEC. But if someone is lacking, one of the player profilers are lacking, like look elsewhere and try to dig in and get a little more context. Because if a guy, you know, might be down in the receiving production, but he's also their kick returner and punt returner and is good at doing that, that tells you that his athletics are enough to, you know, boost him in value. So that's also something to be said for, um, for C C E H. Does he have a nickname yet? Uh, C and it's just Clyde. People say Clyde slide because it's because it's like Okay, yeah, for C E H. Uh, kick returner so he did that throughout his career like he was uh, a guy that had a ton of versatility so if a team can use him and use that versatility um, to be productive like I, I was thinking of him as like a, I looked at him as as a Mark Ingram that's what I saw when I watched him on film first I think he's a little shiftier than Mark Ingram and then I kind of thought maybe like uh, a Devonta Freeman in a sense that's an interesting one uh, one more thing one more tidbit is um the reason why it came out of nowhere is because LSU landed the second best running back recruit out of high school this year. His name is John Emery. Um, and people in the Debbie community before the season started had basically assumed that it was a given fact that John Emery is going to step on the field and take over this backfield. So the fact that Clyde basically relegated him to the bench uh, kind of says a lot about the coach's trust in him and his ability to produce and him as a talent. And that's, yeah. that's something I take comfort in. It's like, who, who are you competing with? 
And who are you taking touches away from, right? Yeah, I mean, his freshman year, he was competing with Darius Geis, so there's no way he was touching the ball as a freshman when Geis was was there. Um, so, yeah, it, again, it always comes down to context because there's so much, like, we, we dissect these, you know, 15 players. And, Mike, you've been tweeting about this. I think this is a good strategy tip because, you know, when you watch our videos, we want to throw in as much strategy as we can to, like, make you better players overall. You talk about how everyone's always going nuts about all the sleepers and rookie drafts. Like, who should we take third, fourth, fifth rounds, even like end of second round where the talent starts to diminish a little bit. Like, it's so important to get these picks right because they're the foundations of your team. Like, yes, you might hit on a few third or fourth round picks as the years go by, but more often than not, there's a reason they go in th third, fourth, fifth round is because they're not up to the talent level. They didn't land in the ideal opportunity like these other guys. So, you know, when you are studying like, don't go nuts about the guys that might go undrafted, especially at this time in the year. Understand the big names first. Try to get to know them as much as you possibly can and then work from there. Don't dive into – don't fucking, you know, put a mouthful in that you can't chew. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Nick, I'm glad you brought up the kick return and punt return thing because this segues beautifully into who my wide receiver one is, and Mike already knows it. Jalen Rager out of TCU. Now, I know you just said don't, like, dive into these deeper name guys, but I'm going to argue that he's not really a deeper name guy, right? He didn't – So fucking 106. He can't be that deep. <laughs> <laughs> For me, at least. But um, he didn't produce really, like, receiving-wise this past season. I know he dealt with drops. I think I saw he dropped seven of 55 catchable passes, which isn't great. But to me, that doesn't really tell the story of who Jalen Rager is. You watch this guy's film, and I'm not exaggerating. He reminds me of Odell Beckham Jr. He makes some of the most ridiculous catches you'll ever see. The guy's like 5'11", 200. He's supposed to like test extremely well athletically. And it's not like he's just going to test well athletically and not use it on the field like a Miles Boykin would. This guy, like high points passes. He outruns defenders. He was used on the uh, kick returns and punt returns, returning a bunch every single season like to the house. There's a clip going around Twitter where apparently he ran like 23 miles an hour down the sideline and absolutely burned everybody in his way. And it's not like I'm just chasing athleticism here. The guy produced in a terrible situation – he has a 95th percentile breakout age at like 18 years old. Um, he also has a 73rd percentile dominator rating. And I think that was this season, which was his down year relative to his sophomore season. Just basically everything you could say that would make a receiver prospect elite. You could say that about Jalen Rager, whether it's versatility, whether it's ability to win on the outside, on the inside, after the catch, before the catch. He's just a phenomenal receiver. And again, with that common knock of him dropping passes, I noticed that a lot of those weren't necessarily over the middle or in contested situations. It was just him trying to do a little bit more with passes than he maybe should have because the team was so bad, whether it be on a screenplay, just like trying to get up field before he hold, like fully hauls the ball in. But when you see the type of grabs he makes, I'm not so sure that hands are a big concern for him. Another like common knock is, you know, his route running. But then again, he's in, he was in a terrible situation. He put up over a thousand yards as a sophomore. You don't necessarily have to be the best route runner in the world. Like, Every single prospect doesn't have to be fucking Stefan Diggs to do well at the next level. Sometimes you're just good at football. Sometimes you understand, you know, lapses in zone coverage. You understand leverage. You don't have to necessarily have the quickest feet, which he actually does have. But um, he checks every box for me, at least. Uh, I think he's going to be a threat at the next level. And I just I just love his entire profile. He's a he's an analytics community so, favorite. Two things real quick. I think that was the first time I ever heard Noah say fuck on the channel before. <laughs> and uh, secondly... Uh, the whole route running thing is just unbelievable on Twitter. Like there are, of course, there are going to be wide receivers who run better routes than other ones. But every time you see a clip with a guy running in shorts, like I, I block, I block that person <laughs> to Twitter as spam. But for real, this goes back to uh, the combine. It's like when someone runs a route because they, Metcalf. they turn, <laughs> they turn right. And the defender who is a guy who's going to be working at fucking target next year, turned left. It makes him look good. And like that, that's the problem with these things is like, you don't know who the defender is that they're going against. So you're talking about route running because he looked good on one play on film is such a horrible, horrible, you know, stance to take on a player. But yes, I mean, he is a great route runner and I'll, I'll let Mike jump back in. I just had to point out those two things. Dude, totally agree, man. Route running is totally overrated, but um, Jalen Rager is maybe a sleeper to the general public, but in, in terms of the analyst community and the Debbie community, people love Rager. And like you said, Noah, even though his production dipped, What's important is that his market share of his team's overall production was still above a certain threshold. So he still had a 33% dominator rating, even though his even though his receiving yards dipped to 600. And that's just because of how bad this team is. Like if you watch TCU games, and Ray Garvin is probably the Jalen Rager 
uh, president of the Jalen Rager fan club, and he turned me on to him uh, a while back. So I've been following him ever since. Um, but the TCU passing game is just absolutely atrocious. Like when you have a player like this, you should be getting him the ball to make plays in space, and they just didn't do that. Not um, to cut you off, Mike, but I would see them. I'd go on my phone and look up like NCAA today or whatever, and I'd see that they were playing. There was a game I think they were playing Oklahoma State. I'm like, oh, I want to see Hubbard. I want to see Tylen Wallace. I want to see Rager. I watched about like two drives. And he wasn't targeted once. I just turned off my TV <laughs> and I hit that SpongeBob on my head out meme because I was so pissed off that I didn't get to see a guy who I like love keep watching going, play get used in the passing game. Yeah, for sure. And that, that's like the main problem, right? Like some of these college offices just aren't that good. And to me, Jalen Rager is the Cam Akers of wide receivers. And I tweeted that. They're both in awful situations, but despite being in awful situations, they're still producing for their team at a very high level. And on that, let's go. Oh, yeah, let's go. Baby. Best fucking key holder of all time. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I, like you said, he's going to be an athletic freak. I know everyone's obsessed about Henry Ruggs and how he's going to shatter the 40. Um, but Henry Ruggs is only fast. Like Rager is fast and he's incredibly athletic. And he actually um, produced in a terrible situation. And Ruggs yeah, quarterback averaged 6.1 yards per attempt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. I think that tells you all you need to know. Um, but, yeah. yeah, I'm on board with you, man. I love Rager. He's not my wide receiver one, but he's definitely in that tier one for me. All right. So, we're going to we're gonna let me go into the wide receiver position, which is probably a huge mistake on, on this show. But I only have two more picks. So, I can't really fuck this one up too bad. I haven't admittedly jumped into Jerry Judy too deep, but I don't believe he is the wide receiver too. I will go with CeeDee Lamb, who is the wide receiver out of Oklahoma. Uh, this kid checks pretty much all the boxes you want to look for. When you're looking at running backs and wide receivers, you look at very different – things when you are scouting them as rookies or as prospects overall like running backs I think there are like five or six check uh, boxes you could check as almost like strictly analytical right it's it's like the size the speed um, so combine kind of stuff the production against good competition etc cetera, etc cetera, catching the ball when it comes to wide receivers you guys have brought up dominator rating you guys have brought up breakout age and for those people that are kind of new what that means is uh, college dominator rating is basically a percentage of uh, the production that your offense had. So like you said with Rhaegar, like he might not have had the raw stats, you know, 650, 700 receiving yards or whatever. But when that's 50% of your team's passing offense, that looks a lot better. And that's the way you need to be looking at things. So in terms of college dominator, when you hear that, that's basically just uh, encapsulating how much of the overall production of the offense that receiver had. So he was, in, in, in essence, dominating his college. So when you hear like 68th percentile, 75th percentile, that's really good. That's, you know, the percentile among NFL wide receivers and what they did at that age. Breakout age <clears throat> is just what age that that player broke out. I believe it's like when they had a 20th or 20% of the college dominator at what age they did that at. Um, and that just makes raw sense from a fucking maturing standpoint. Like if you're an 18 year old and you're putting up these crazy numbers against kids who are 19, 20, 21, hitting their growth spurts or hitting their second growth spurts and already developing with their college quarterbacks, like that's, that's a big deal. That can't be overlooked. So we'll bring those up a lot for wide receivers. So when you look at CD lamb, he's a guy who um, performed very well on the college dominator scale, 68th percentile. And a lot of these numbers are already up for the bigger profile names on uh, playerprofiler.com. And Mike, you probably have a, another resource where you could find these things um, in terms of breakout eight he broke out at 19. So that's in the 81st percentile. And he was a guy who's gone back to back years go, going over a thousand yards. And that's always good to see from the wide receiver position, 11 touchdowns, 14 touchdowns. And another guy who uh, contributed in the special teams game. So he was returning punts for Oklahoma all three years, um, 24 punt returns last year. So it shows his versatility. He's like 6'2", 6'3", almost 200, uh, 195, 200 pounds. So he's got the size um, and he should perform well all around. So I, I like CeeDee Lamb a lot. Yeah, obviously an underrated part is you could look at his sophomore season and say, oh, he played with Kyler Murray. Obviously he's going to produce. This year he played with Jalen Hurts, who is a million times worse of a quarterback than Kyler Murray. And he had more yards. I think he had less touchdowns, but he had like more receptions. Either way, he put up yeah, a fan. 14 touchdowns. He went up from 11 to 14. And his yards per reception went from 17.8 to 21.4. So monster, monster play threat. Yeah, so maybe it was the receptions that went down. But either way, the guy just showed he could produce. And I know the common narrative is, you know, Big 12 doesn't play defense, which is true. But you don't put up those type of numbers without being a fantastic receiver. And one part of his game that I know Mike has talked about or tweeted about um, that's really underrated and you don't see it in the box score is how well this guy can track a deep ball and like how well he hauls it in. You just throw it deep to him. He's not the fastest guy. He may not be the most athletic, but he just catches everything. It's like a spider web. He reminds me of DeAndre Hopkins where, you know, he could beat you off the line just because of his technique and, you know, his savviness at the position. He's not going to beat you with speed, but when the ball is in the air, it's not a 50-50 ball. It's like a 95-5 ball, especially 
between the Big 12, it's about like a 110 to like negative 10 ball. But I think the next <laughs> I like be, that, baby. <laughs> he's going to be a fantastic receiver. He's talked about being in like the top five to 10 picks. So obviously the draft capital is going to be there. The only thing that's really left for him is athleticism. And I don't think he's a bad athlete by any means. Yeah, I totally agree. CeeDee Lamb is my wide receiver one, and it took me a long time to get there. Um, I was a Jerry Judy truther, but if you just look at the age-adjusted production, and what I mean by that is like how he produced and how he increases production relative to competition year over year, he has on, he's on a very positive trajectory, and he had a monster season this year, arguably with the worst quarterback he played with. And if you look at competition, like he's competed with Hollywood Brown, um, guys who have actually went first round in the NFL, so it's not like he's competing with scrubs. So yeah, I think that's, that perspective, that's he, the other thing, too. Um, you see a lot of people, you know, starting to focus more on dynasty, and they're talking about if players have low college dominator rating, it's important to look at who the teammates are, uh, you know, that they play around. So a lot of the reason that you might have less receiving yards last year is, like you said, he played with Hollywood Brown, who's a first-round NFL pick. So, of course, he's going to have less receiving yards. So, again, context, 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 people. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I love, I love CeeDee Lamb. He's, he's definitely my wide receiver one. So that's a great pick. Uh, Nick stole that one. Uh, yeah. Lucky me, baby. Um, so for my next pick, uh, it's, it's, it's a really tough one for me to make. I've been juggling back and forth between these two guys in, in my rankings. Um, but I'm going to just stick with my guy, uh, Jerry Judy. And he's been getting a ton of hate on Twitter um, from not, – not, not hate, but just, I guess, dislike and disapproval from some of the analyst community because – uh, he did really well last year as a sophomore. He obviously he was the best wide receiver in the nation. Um, but this year he took a major dip. And there's a major debate going on right now about, like, why his dominator doesn't matter, why his market share doesn't matter, because he's playing with four other first-round wide receivers, which I believe is actually a gross exaggeration. Um, I, don't think, I don't think the talent is that, that good. Um, but there is something to be said uh, for the fact that he does play with a lot of talent around him. Um, but he wasn't able to cross that 30% dominator threshold, which is what you're really looking for um, in that final season. But when you look at like the film, like, you know, we say route, run, route running is overrated, but when you are an elite route runner, I think, you know, there is something to be said for that because you can just basically plug him into the offense and, and let him go. Um, yeah, you're, so you're, you're a big Amari Cooper guy. And I feel like that's a big thing that, you know, people watch Amari Cooper and they're like, this guy's fucking elite. In, in the sense of route running. And, you know, it's the same way I look at running backs. Like people will always be like, oh, he's got great awareness and contact balance and whatever. And it's like, cool, whatever, that's your subjective view. But that will eventually turn into production. Like if his contact balance is so good, he won't average 4.5 yards per carry. He'll average 5.5 yards per carry. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's like if he has great route running, uh, aside from his quarterback being terrible or something like that, then the production will be there, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think he's, he's, he's probably one of the most ready to go quarter, uh, sorry, wide receivers in the class. And the reason why I don't have him as high as I used to is one, because of the analytics side of things. I do consider that in my rankings. Um, but also I feel like um, he might not be that prototype wide receiver one. So although he has a really good floor and I don't think he'll bust, I don't think he has the same ceiling that someone like CeeDee Lamb does. Um, and he, he doesn't have the best hands. He can catch the ball uh, fine, but he's not someone that's going to leap over some guy, an NFL defender, and snatch it from the air. He's not someone that's going to win a contested catch. And in that way, he's very similar to Cooper. Like, Cooper is not good in contested catch situations. That's why he's never been that great in the red zone. He needs space to work with to basically put dudes on skates and embarrass them. But if you're really tight uh, with him, he's not as effective. And I think, like, Judy would be best – uh, suited landing somewhere where they have someone else who is a prototype wide receiver one, or he gets taken with someone that's a prototype wide receiver one. But from a floor perspective, I think he's one of the safest in the class. Um, and he, he's still an elite receiver. So I get all the hate and all the analytics around it, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I still like to go with my gut and trust my eyes a little bit. And he's still in that tier one wide receiver for me. Yeah, exactly what you just said. Like him not producing as number one. He kind of reminds me of Emmanuel Sanders in that aspect where he's a fantastic receiver, but he definitely benefits a lot from having somebody else on the other side, whether it was Demarius Thomas or Cortland Sutton. Um, I'm not so sure about how athletically those two will test it, like what, how similar they'll be athletically. But as you said, like this guy was basically the consensus 101 for two seasons, and he kind of dropped off this year because his market share dipped down. So it's not to say he's a bad player because he's being taken at, what is it, like the 107 right now? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that – anybody is as high on him right now as they were to begin the season or even last year. Yeah. Well, so I didn't really pay attention 
to college football, like prior to last year, I felt like all I heard was Jerry Judy was like the next fucking, the next big thing at, at the NFL wide receiver position. So um, it's good to see that Mike can pivot a little bit. Um, so before, what pick are we at right now? The 109? 109. All right, before we do that real quick, I know we're, we're pretty deep into this episode, but I think uh, <laughs> my roommate just texted me, he goes, what about Anthony Miller? <laughs> I was, <laughs> was going to start this episode off uh, by taking A.J. Brown at the 101 and just see how, <laughs> how it went from there, if you guys would have allowed me to do that. Uh, real quick, though, we are working on some stuff behind the scenes for the, uh, the audience out there. I'm sure a lot of you guys purchased the draft guide that we put together last year for the season long. Uh, we also did a dynasty guide, which was an absolute shit show because one day we were just like, oh, let's put together a dynasty rookie guide. And uh, we kind of put it together on the go. But this year we're, we're doing a lot more prep for it. It will be uh, way, 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 way better in terms of content. We are writing out all the profiles now. So as we give you the week by week bunk bed breakdowns, um, just know that there is – uh, a lot more content in the guide right now, and it is on sale for a very monster price. It is on sale for pre-order as of today. This is the first day it's on sale if you're watching this on Wednesday. So you'll be able to get it for like 50% off. And as the months goes goes by, you know, it's a fucking business over here. We got we got we got to bring in the revenue. So it will be going up a little bit, um, but this is the cheapest you will be able to to grab it. So we have the Dynasty Rookie Guide. It'll be all the player profiles for all the biggest name prospects. We'll do a ton of uh, exclusive mock drafts similar to this with different. Um, scoring settings and super flex and tight end premium and all that kind of stuff. And there'll be a ton of exclusive articles on there um, that we will expand upon. And it'll be real time updated in terms of our ranking uh, for dynasty rookie, all those kind of things. So big dog draft You can go cop your pre-order. It will probably launch on April 1st, I want to say. And again, we will be updating it throughout the entire um, off season. And as the NFL draft and stuff comes on. So big dog draft guide.com 109 Noah. It is. Can I plug the Slack as well? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, I'll put in the description. It's a link to a Slack channel that, you know, we set up to get new time, like first time dynasty players to learn the rules, uh, get into leagues with other people. You know, Mike and I are going to co-manage a team later in the season and play with 11 of you guys. So um, it's completely free. You guess you just put in your email. You guys get to talk about rookie deals. Uh, we, we have a, a few channels where you can put in like screenshots of your team or pictures of trades and Mike and I on the show are going to take one or two per episode after you guys draft. Um, so it's more interactive and we'll break down the trade, see uh, what advice we can give you, how your team benefits from a trade or roster advice, like potential moves to make uh, who's on your waiver wire, that type of stuff. So it's a more interactive way to start playing dynasty, especially if you're from Nick's core audience where it's, you know, mostly redraft. I'd say if you guys want to start getting into it, uh, it's $50 leagues or you can join a free league. If you just want to get your feet wet uh, in the dynasty uh, area, I guess you could say so. The Slack channel. So for those of y'all that don't know what Slack is, it's basically like an instant messaging platform where you sign up and uh, there's different channels and topics and whatever you want to dra- dive into. There's like, you know, people talking about different trades that are going on. And if you want to join a league, the, the Slack channel itself is completely free. And Noah said, I'll put the link down below if you want to join the Slack channel network so you guys can talk about shit. Um, but people will be, people within the audience will be setting up their own dynasty leagues and those will be paid if you want to join a paid one. So it just, it gives you more opportunity to go uh, talk with people um, that are in, in kind of the dynasty mindset right now. Snacks is texting me nonstop. Can you guys hear that ding going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So annoying. Look, look at him. He's fucking thirsty ass snacks. <laughs> You're asking me to join the Slack channel because I'm done talking about dynasty trades with you. Actually, you know, let's bring up live on air right now. This is a, a trade that he's thinking about doing. Um, so he's going to get Zeke. He's going to give up Chris Godwin. He, uh, he's going to give up the 208 this year. And he's also going to give up next year's first round pick, which we don't know what, let's say one. I, that's what I said too. I said, he's going to be losing that trade, but he's really desperate at running back. And, uh, he has three 2021 20, firsts already. So he's giving up one of them. I said, either way, you're losing the deal, but he wants the running back. He yeah. Wants you can probably get a running back of similar value for much less than that. I'd say so. I, would I also think like, in startups right now, Zeke and Godwin are probably going, what, like seven or eight picks apart, if that? Godwin's the top five dynasty dynasty wide receiver. So he's going, he's going to be going the first yeah, round. So he's probably like eight, between the eight and 11 spot, and Zeke's probably like the four to six range. So in, yeah, in my eyes, I think he's definitely losing that trade. But Snacks is going to fucking Snacks. We all know that. Yeah. I love yeah. getting uh, trade requests from uh, – not trade requests, but trade advice questions from Snacks. Oh, they're always hilarious. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, 109. Talking about Chris Godwin – He's my comp for this player, which might sound a little crazy. We've got Brian Edwards out of South Carolina. I don't even know who the fuck he is, but I know you love him. All right, good. 
Nick, I need you to guess what his breakout age is. How old do you think he was when he broke out? I don't even know who he is. How would I guess this? Just guess. Come on. Yes. Uh, I'm going to have to go really low because you made it like he broke out in high school. He had a sweet 16. Yeah, he was 12, just like Carlos from the Brent Bench Warmers. He had a little <laughs> green birth certificate. All right, tell me. He was 17, which I don't know the percentile, but that is probably 100th percentile. 99th percentile for sure. 99th, yeah. Okay. He was dominating the SEC from the moment he stepped foot on campus. He did it for all four years. He did come back this past season, and there's a guy in one of my dynasty leagues who's a Gamecocks fan, and he said he, he came back to break records. I'm not sure if he did. Uh, he only played 10 games this season, but he still put up over 800 yards. Uh, throughout his career, he put up almost 3,100 yards from scrimmage. You know, he got so a why, few. If he broke out at 17 and dominated for four straight years, why is he not higher than the 109? Honest question, because I don't know anything about him. It's 17.9. So he's like, he's close to 18, but he's, he's definitely a 17th year. Is there like, what's, what's the knock on him? Is it size? So, is it speed? Is it? From an analytics perspective, you don't really want to see guys return back for their senior year. And the but why, if you're so young, that it really shouldn't matter, I guess, right? Yeah, but the reason why you don't want to see it is because uh, if you're young and you dominated college, there's really nothing more for you to prove at the college level. So you want to see them go to the NFL and play up to the competition instead of play down. And if you look at, like, Edwards, he still had a good dominator, but, I mean, he didn't really, like, continue to, like, explode in his fourth year. I was going to say, I'm looking at the numbers now, and, like, he played well, but when you look at other college wide receivers and they're putting up – I mean, he never surpassed 850 receiving yards in a year. So when we talk about dominating, you're breaking out at age 17. He did it probably because the rest of the offense was not a high-powered passing offense, right? You want to have the percentage – you want to own a percentage of the passing offense. But his raw numbers don't look great. Again, like this is completely subjective to what I'm seeing, and I don't really know much about him. Uh, you probably like him probably for his film and stuff like that too. Yeah, and also because last year he was competing with Debo Samuel, which may have been a reason why he came back, just to like prove that he could be the guy. And his numbers aren't too impressive, but just a per-game basis. You know, he played 10 games, so it's 7.1 catches, 81.6 yards, and 0.6 touchdowns. So you could pace that out to 13 games to match his other numbers. But, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Just watching this guy's film, I really don't see any weaknesses. He makes fantastic catches. And I know it's all subjective, route running and stuff like that. But for a guy that's like 6'3", 215, he moves extremely well. And there's film against Alabama that, you know, Ray GQ has put out. And I put out a few, like, clips. He's going up against guys that are actually playing press coverage in the SEC. And he's burning them off the line. He's beating them after the catch. He's big. He's physical. He can win in all phases of the game. And I know Mike doesn't like that he went back for his senior season. And I'm not, like, too analytical in terms of knowing how much that hurts his profile. But I think just watching the guy play and, you know, playing with Debo Samuel and still putting up good seasons is why I'm a huge fan of Brian Edwards. Yeah, it's definitely not a kiss of death. Um, like, when I said I was trying to decide who to pick between, it was between Jerry Judy and Brian Edwards. Uh, I have them literally back-to-back, -back and I'm – flipping back and forth. Um, so his yards, if you look at the counting stats, is not that impressive, but he still was able to dominate in terms of like with respect to his teammates. Like he had 30.6% of the market share of the receiving yards and he had 50% of the total receiving touchdowns. So from that perspective, he was still the offense. Um, the game costs just don't, they just don't pass that much. So that's why it's important to try and consider like market share instead of just looking at the raw stats. Cause he's never going to be as impressive as someone like CD lamb where they throw it like a million times. Um, but he's still impressive in terms of what he was able to do within his own, the confines of his own team. Yeah. Um, speaking of non-impressive raw totals, this guy has a complete fucking opposite. And that's Justin Jefferson wide receiver out of LSU. I don't know if I love this kid because I think he's going to be really good at the next level or if that night in New Orleans, Mike, last week, he won me a shit ton of money. So I'm really excited about him. He looked really good. But he was an integral part of this passing offense that, again, was one of the best passing offenses we've ever seen in college football. Justin Jefferson is really big, really long, really great in the deep game, 6'3", 195, 200 pounds-ish. Um, he was a guy who hit the 30% college dominator rating. Uh, he also broke out at like 19 and a half, with the, which is in the 75th percentile. His raw numbers this year, he led the entire NCAA in catches. He had 111 catches, 1,540 receiving yards, 18 touchdowns. I mean, just from looking at raw numbers, how can you look at this guy and not think he's worthy of a, of a first-round pick? So what are the knocks against him, you guys have said? Uh, I actually really like Justin Jefferson. Um, he's another one. He's currently my wide receiver six, so I'm glad you didn't take my wide receiver five there. Um, but in, from an analytics perspective, like he broke out uh, at age 19, 
Um, you know that he's competing with elite talent. You have Jamar Chase, who's my current wide receiver one for the 2021 class, and well, he just won the Blitnikoff. So he was the nation's best wide receiver. Um, and then, obviously, he was a beneficiary of that incredible offense this year. Um, but he was even producing last year. So from a breakout perspective, he's there. From a market share perspective, he's there. From a film perspective, he's there. He, I mean, he's a pretty developed route runner. What does that sound? It's someone's mic. It don't matter. I don't know what that was. Yeah. I, I heard it too. I'm not sure if it's from Mike. It's 100% Mike's fault. But. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay. raining? No, so San Diego? I'm you, but we'll, whatever. We're yeah. Go. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he checks the boxes from Alex's perspective, and he checks the boxes from me from just watching him play. So... Um, I actually really like him. I don't have that many knocks against him. The only maybe slight knock against him is um, his size. So I don't know if you guys have been tracking Twitter at all, but there's been all this talk about, like, BMI and whether or not it matters. Uh, for me, like, I'm not really tracking it that closely because I don't know how accurate these measurements are, and five pounds here or there can really throw it off. But he has a – at his latest measurements, he has a BMI of 24.4, which is a decent amount below kind of that 26 threshold that people are using to try and determine whether or not someone can have the ceiling that you want to see. Um, but like I said, I'm not really putting too much weight into that at this point. Yeah, yeah, me personally, I haven't watched like much film on him. I've just seen the games when he's on national television and the guy's just like, he's good at everything. Like there's not really a weakness in his game that I see. And was it against Auburn or Alabama that game? He had like four touchdowns in the first half or maybe it was Oklahoma, one of those mm -hmm. top schools. He made so many ridiculous contested catches in those situations where like, at first, you kind of wonder, is he just a guy who runs out of the slot and racks up catches over the middle? But he proved in that game that he can do it in all phases of the game. Um, he kind of reminds me a little bit of like a lower end Devontae Adams in that sense where, you know, he can win off the line. He can win in contested situations. Obviously, his numbers prove that he was a very good receiver. And the breakout obviously also helps his profile. My, uh, th this LSU offense is going to be so interesting to look back on because, you know, we're, you have to be high on like every piece of the offense. But in like five years, we're going to look back and either be like, holy shit, like the reason they were so good is because they had so much talent together. Was it the offense? Was it just like Joe Burrow is the next fucking Aaron Rodgers? So it's hard to say because one of the things you love about Justin Jefferson is his ability to, you know, grab those deep balls. But I'm, I, you look at Burrow and he's like the most accurate deep ball thrower that we've seen in, in like quite some time. So it's like, you know, chicken or the egg here for me. But I, just, I mean, everything um, about Justin Jefferson's profile and what I've seen from him tells me that, uh, that I love him and I'm probably going to be looking at him in the back, back half of the first round for uh, a lot of my rookie drafts. For sure. Uh, so in terms of my next pick, I'm going to go hit up the losing team from the championship game in the Clemson Tigers and take uh, T. Higgins. Um, so T. Higgins is a very – I think he's more of that prototype wide receiver one. He's 6'3", uh, 205 pounds. Um, in terms of breakout, he broke out in early age as well, so he really checks off that box for me personally. He's an underclassman, so he's declaring early for the draft. And obviously, uh, he also benefited from being on the same team as uh, I like to call him uh, Football Jesus, but people know him as Trevor Lawrence. Um, so I think from the film perspective, like he really wins in those contested catch situations. He knows how to use the size, and he knows how to contort his body to put himself in a place to win at the catch point. And I think that's a skill that not many people have, and it's really hard to learn and teach after they join the NFL. So guys like Lamb and guys like Higgins uh, who enter the NFL with that skill set is going to be pretty crucial. Um, the knock against Higgins, obviously, is that, you know, he, went, he played in the ACC uh, where there's basically no real teams and Clemson – outmatches everyone and they just dominate everyone every single year um, and obviously you're not playing against like SEC corners either so he's seeing very little press uh, he also probably needs a lot of development on the route running side but as we've already covered like route running is not really something that I take in too heavily unless you're super elite at it like Jerry Judy because you know that's something you learn like route running for also like runners. if you're not a great route runner it's also your coach's uh, your coach's responsibility to put you into positions where you could beat your defenders, where you're not playing against press coverage, move them into the slot more, you know, move them around line of scrimmage before the, before the snap. Like that's, you know, you could be a bad route runner and still succeed in the NFL too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've seen successes before. Like Des Bryant was never a good route runner, but he could win it at the contested catch point at every single time. So you don't have to be a great route runner to produce. And I just think that even if he isn't like he has the skill sets to actually be successful in the NFL. Um, so I'm taking him here. Yeah, as for what you said about route running, I think the only thing that impacts what I see out of them is I think it may take a little bit long for that player to produce or maybe 
you know, transition to the NFL. I know Nikhil Harry, that was like a common knock on him. And obviously he was hurt to start a season. But what we saw out of him last year is he's really good at being used in space. And the Patriots didn't necessarily use him too much, like in that facet of the game. They try to use him deep a little bit more in contested situations. And that's what kind of worries me a little bit about these guys going into the NFL. Not that I don't think that their ceiling is as high as, you know, other guys ranked around them. I just think it might take a little bit longer for them to break out. But you got to remember, these guys are 20, 21 years old. It's not like the nail in the coffin if they can't run a fucking out route when they're 19 years old playing against whoever's in the ACC. Bring out the gritty side in Noah. I like this. I, I get hyped up and I don't know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense now, actually. <laughs> I, got, I got to make up for my lack of analysis. Yeah, but I, I completely agree. He's that big prototypical wide receiver that the NFL is kind of moving away from right now, but I think he has a skill set to really develop into a true wide receiver one, similar to like, Mike Williams is slowly taking on a bigger role in the NFL. Okay. Well, why don't you keep on rolling? Why don't you keep on yelling and cursing at us and hit us with the last pick of the first round? All right. We're going to finish up with a guy who I kind of don't like, but I do like. It's LaVisca Chenault Jr. out of Colorado. And, the like, the common knock on him is injuries. Now, I don't know exactly what That's injuries. A That's a tough first name. Repeat <laughs> it for us again. LaVisca Chenault Jr. So his dad was LaVisca Chenault. So you should know. He's got two line. He's got some lineage there, but. Um, I'm not so sure what the what the injuries were that he sustained. All I know is he's never played a full season in college. But when this guy's on the field, he is electric. He's been like drawing comparisons of Percy Harvin. He lines up out of the backfield at tight end, out wide in the Wildcat. He's like he's big. He's like six two, two twenty. He's probably running the four fours, four fives. He wins like deep down the field. He wins in screen games. He kind of also reminds me of like a Nikhil Harry who we saw last year really dominate in college in the screen game and when used you know, in space. And that's also something that may worry me at the next level is maybe they try to use him as a prototypical outside wide receiver because of his size. And I know last year, like something you can't really see just by looking at the numbers is like how these guys play. And that's why I was a little bit higher in McLaurin than a bunch of other guys, because you see he's a four, three, five guy and he's a bit smaller and he didn't produce. So you think he's just a situational deep threat. It's similar to LaVisca Chenault where you see his size and you see like his yards perception. You might think that he's just an X receiver who's going to run deep down the field every play. But he's just a Swiss Army knife that whoever drafts him, I've been seeing him going in the first and second round of mock drafts, they're yeah. probably going to know the skill set that he has, and they're probably going to use him to his best, of abil- his best ability at the next level, which is why I'm kind of warming up to him as a prospect. Yeah, I don't know much about him, but I have seen him go in uh, a lot of first-round mocks so far for people that um, have been putting out that type of content um, on Twitter and through the fantasy football sphere thus far. Anything to add there for uh, Mr. Lavishka, Michael? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in terms of talent and, like, raw ability, uh, I think that's the main draw for Visca. I mean, we call him a wide receiver, but, I mean, he could just as easily be a running back. Like, if you're watching this guy, like you said, he's huge, um, and he's really good with the ball in his hands. Uh, The one knock on him is, like, I mean, how healthy is he going to stay? He's missed a ton of games while he's in college, and he's taken a ton of punishment because he's consistently catching the ball, like, at the line of scrimmage. Um, So he's been taking an absolute beating. Um, if you were to tell me, if you were to tell me that he could play a full, healthy 16 game season, I think he would shoot up most people's draft boards, but I think most of the ranking concern just comes down to whether or not he can play a full, healthy season. Interesting. All right. So we don't know the actual injuries right off the top of our head, but you can go research that if you want. Yeah. He's a very versatile player. I mean, 86 catches in 2018, despite only playing in nine games, that's over nine catches per game, which is ridiculous. And then this year, um, 25, 23 carries, almost 25 carries, seven yards per carry. So, again, he gets it done. He's successful no matter what aspect of the game he's in. So, uh, again, a lot of these guys are going to come down to draft capital, where they end up being drafted, because you need coaches that can put these players in positions to succeed, like we saw um, for a lot of rookies this year. So uh, that is our first bunk bed breakdown episode ever. Uh, we are slowly going to turn into the best dynasty podcast in the fucking world. So – If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you uh, let us know where we can improve. Let us know things that you'd like to see throughout the offseason, what type of content you'd like to see for Dynasty. We'll definitely get into, you know, um, NFL players as well, like trade targets, buy buy low, sell high, that kind of stuff. But for right now, I want to dive into the rookie class and get you kind of excited because the Super Bowl is almost here and the 2019 season will be officially in the books. so that's all we got for today. Make sure you're following those too. And uh, go check out bigdogsdraftguide.com. Go cop the guide. Cheapest it's ever going to be right now. I love y'all. We're out. Peace.